So marine scientific research, what we're talking about is not the actual research itself. We're talking about access to do research, access to the information, dissemination, publication, all the package that goes with it. Um, so in order to do this, what I would like to do is start with the international legal regime. And uh, for the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, most, but not all, of the coastal states have uh, ratified the Law of the Sea Convention. <clears throat> And the Law of the Sea Convention uh, is an important convention for a number of reasons. And one of them is that it really provide, provided for the first time what we might call a comprehensive framework for marine scientific research. Uh, there was also in the uh, 1958 Geneva Convention, but that was limited to the continental shelf. So what's important, I think, to realize that in this regime, it recognizes that all states have the right to conduct marine scientific research, subject to the rights and duties. And we have to remember that. There is unilateralism is always subject to the rights and duties of other states. This is very important. And often, I think, states forget this when they're exercising their rights. And also, states have the obligation to promote and facilitate marine scientific research. So that's the general framework. Um, and then there are also important principles that are provided by the convention. And I'm not going to go through all this, but I think what's important is that, uh, that peaceful purposes um, and that also that marine scientific research be conducted in accordance with re regulations, specifically also protection of the marine environment. Now, of course, as we've already seen, one of the uh, important aspects of the Law of the Sea Convention was it did apportion marine space. Uh, it extended areas and created new zones, such as the exclusive economic zone that um, uh, my dear colleague Ellie mentioned. Uh, this is important for marine scientific research because according to the zones, uh, the rights of the coastal state um, have been determined. For example, in the territorial sea, where the state under uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, um, and I guess we could say in customary international law as well, has complete sovereignty over this area. And what that means is that for marine scientific research, the state has the exclusive competence to give consent and to determine the conditions of marine scientific research. And that's about it. The, the convention is fairly um, uh, simple on that point. But that's not simple necessarily for us, because what we want to know in an enclosed sea, such as the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, is whether uh, in the case of the Mediterranean, you have 21 states. In the case of the Black Sea, six states. Uh, within their own national uh, practice, uh, how consent is being given, what the criteria are. And this is why it is important when we're looking at a sea of limited space. In the high seas, OK, uh, it's freedom of marine scientific research. In the Black Sea, uh, we no longer have high seas. It's pretty well been all delimited with the EEZ. But in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the situation is quite different. Um, let's look at the EEZ, because really the convention uh, focuses quite a bit on this. I will just say, uh, basically, that the principle behind the EEZ is that it is an area that was once high seas, that means subject to freedom. And it was enclosed uh, under the convention. So there was a debate between freedom and uh, uh, freedom of, from navigation, but in this case, marine scientific research, to a uh, coastal state having complete competence. So they came to this compromise. So what is a compromise? Basically, it says that, OK, the coastal state in the exclusive economic zone um, has a competence to give consent. On the other hand, under normal circumstances, whatever those are, it cannot deny consent. Uh, and also, for uh, marine scientific research, that is for peaceful purposes and to increase scientific knowledge for the benefit of mankind. And this is very important. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are some uh, situations where it can. It does have the discretion to deny consent. And then it also gives all the rights that the coastal state has, access to information, access to a preliminary and final report, access to the data. And it also gives the conditions of when it can be terminated. So it's a very 
mixed, complex uh, uh, regime, actually, that you see under here. And I think, again, when we're talking about enclosed seas, such as the Black Sea, where there is now no high seas, and the Mediterranean Sea, which potentially will have a point where it also will not have any more high seas, because there are still are high seas. Uh, this will be critical in understanding what does this mean exactly uh, when we're talking about regulating at the regional level. Also, it's important to look at the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention for Protection of the Marine Environment, uh, because specifically there are provisions related to scientific research, but it's basically about cooperation, exchange of information, and also providing scientific support, uh, what we could call, to some degree, capacity building for developing states. So the re what I wanted to look at is, should we have a regional approach to marine scientific research? And why? Well, it's very simple. As you see, we are an enclosed or semi-enclosed sea. We are in a limited space, and we're sharing the same marine uh, resources. So it doesn't make sense, really, to have this fragmentation uh, in an area where, if we're talking about ecosystem-based management, we're talking about marine spatial planning, uh, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about all these things, we really cannot separate them based on these artificial zones that have been created by uh, governments, policymakers, whatever. So, um, so it's important, I think, to look at how and whether we can have this regional approach. And Elie has already made a comment about Article 123. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. I have a slightly different view, but we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, so basically, in the, I've talked about the existing uh, maritime zones in the Black Sea and the uh, Mediterranean. So it's, it, is, it does make it complicated when you look at the international legal framework and how it would be applied. Because right now, it's basically on state practice. And we, we have limited knowledge in general. Some states have legislation, some states don't. Uh, it's not uniform. And there have been some studies uh, looking into that. The regional instruments, um, there are you know, several regional instruments that involve scientific research, but that is different from actually creating the legal regime for it. Uh, and so what I have done, just in the interest of time, is to look at the Unit Regional Seas program, because that is probably the one that comes closest to providing for a regional governance system. Um, and here, when we look at the different articles, again, it is implementing what Ellie said about Article 123, and that is cooperation in scientific studies, in joint programs, in exchange of data related to those scientific studies, capacity building. Um, and also, there are implementing protocols. Again, in this case, it, it's along the same uh, line. Uh, for the Black Sea, we also have the Bucharest system. Uh, and it, it does provide for a mechanism and obligations of cooperation in conducting scientific research. And again, this is all related primarily to protection of the marine environment against pollution, but also for biodiversity as well. Uh, and there are uh, protocols um, that operationalize that in the specific context of biodiversity and land-based sources of pollution. Um, I also wanted to just mention a little bit the European Union, because the European Union uh, also um, does not have uh, a common approach to marine scientific research, does not have a legal framework. And this is something that is being discussed uh, quite a bit right now. There are some instruments, uh, and it looks like that is the direction they are going with this. Um, and it is important because, again, when you look at, for example, the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, which also has a very strong regional uh, focus, it's important to see how uh, research related to implementing uh, these instruments uh, will be conducted and that there be some kind of common um, approach. So uh, does the existing regional marine scientific research framework address various issues here, and these are just some of the other issues that could be related to, uh, uh, actually, I do know my conclusion, so I don't need to have a... I would say that when you look at the existing regional framework, um, first of all, there is nothing that is implementing uh, Article 13 and the principles and the framework that is under the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, when you look at the Regional Seas Program, what it does essentially is to implement uh, the 
uh, Part 12 of the Convention on and, part, and, and also Article 123 on uh, environmental protection. But otherwise, um, nothing else exists. Um, so the question then is, should there be uh, a regional approach? And I think that's the question that I would like to leave uh, for the debate, whether um, this is something that uh, we could envision for these seas. Thank you very much. <laughs>